Hello all, welcome to DFI India Groundwork Webinar 1. I am Pranav from DFI India office and I welcome you all to this program. Few uh, ground rules, recording of this webinar is prohibited. Certificates will be prepared and emailed to you in approximately two weeks time and online webinar recording recording will be made available to you in approximately two weeks time. Uh, you can view your uh, window in full screen mode. You can click on the third tab of your control panel and you can hide your control panel using the top red arrow button so that you see clear screen. During the program, if you want to ask question to the presenter, you can type it in the questions box and send it to us. Please make sure to include your name and your organization name so that we can read it out during the QA session. And you can also go to your hand, uh, handouts tab where we have put few brochures for you to refer. You can download the brochures from there. Now I welcome Professor Amit Prashant, who is the moderator for today's session. Uh, Professor Amit Prashant is from IIT Gandhinagar. He's Professor and Dean of Research and Development there. Yeah. So welcome, Professor Amit. Now you Thank can you, take Pranav. over the session. Yeah. Welcome to all of you. And this is wonderful beginning of, a, I think, long innings that we are going to have on a student uh, initiative of Deep Foundation Institute. And this is the first event of the, you can say the whole initiative. And it is our honor to have Professor Harry Polis uh, giving us the good start that we need for this program. Uh, so today we are going to have an introductory presentation also. And we are fortunate to have Professor Mr. Madha for that. Uh, regarding uh, geotechnical engineering, how ground and soil uh, versus soil uh, in a very interesting manner that he's going to, uh, you can say, simulate that to something uh, what we see in daily life. And uh, followed by Professor Polis uh, talking about the foundation design challenges for tall buildings. And then you will have a chance to ask some questions. And I hope uh, we are able to address all the questions. Uh, as far as possible. And then we have an interesting presentation on professional development uh, by Ms. Uh, Mary Allen, uh, who is part of DFI, uh, rather DFI uh, kind of is given shoulder by her in a way. Um, then we have, we'll take some questions there also. And uh, so uh, in the end, we will also share what is going to happen in future, near future. Uh, next slide, please. So as I mentioned, uh, this student initiative is of course to create, uh, you can say uh, awareness and uh, some kind of, uh, you can say connection with the students so that uh, they are aware of uh, what are the challenges and what are the excitements uh, that are there in this field uh, through DFI platform, but uh, the objective is to hold geotechnical engineering and construction industry as such. And we will have this uh, event in various forms and hopefully uh, various forms will be enjoyed by different groups of people uh, rather i would expect that everybody participates in all the activities and uh, monthly webinars interactions with industry leaders uh, in student competitions like in the last conference uh, we had a student competitions and there were some interesting solutions that were suggested by the students and there were some winners that are there on the website of dfi india uh, Membership, uh, a student membership to DFI uh, is free. And uh, it is uh, our excitement to see you excited about uh, this whole, uh, you can say, challenging world of geotechnical engineering as such. Uh, a group is working, and I think some names are here, but many more people are. Anirudhan is making a lot of effort as well, uh, who is, uh, and Mary Ellen's input in uh, shaping up the groundwork. Uh, is really appreciable, I would say. So with, with the hope uh, we uh, have some more members joining us uh, in making the effort. And all of you 
joining us as a member of the FI student chapter, uh, DFI India student chapter as well. So we begin with the uh, talk by Professor Madhav. Uh, I think everybody knows him, but it is my responsibility to uh, kind of uh, reiterate a little bit uh, about his background. Uh, his he was Institute Fellow, IIT Kanpur, AICT, INAE Distinguished uh, Visiting Professor and Visiting Professor at uh, IIT Hyderabad, as well as uh, JNQ Hyderabad, Professor Emeritus. Um, resource Person at, at RGUKK and uh, Advisor Consultant for several organizations. is well known uh, internationally as a researcher, teacher and consultant and has contributed significantly to the practice of geotechnical engineering over the last five decades. It's a long innings that uh, brings us uh, uh, enriched uh, insights uh, from him today. Uh, he has worked at several universities abroad as well. He has worked with Professor Poulos also, uh, and uh, Australia, Canada, Japan, Belgium, UK are few of them. Uh, his interest spans to the whole gamut of geotechnical engineering. Uh, he has guided more than 45 doctoral and several master's thesis uh, and final year projects. Uh, he has uh, co-edited a book on lowlands uh, development and management, uh, foundations and soft, and soft ground engineering, uh, challenges in Mac and Delta, and authored more than 600 publications in the free international and national journals and conferences. He has received also numerous awards and recognitions, including Kevin Professor uh, Mera Research, uh, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru Birth Centenary Research Awards and Doctor of Science of Indian Institute of Science. Uh, he was the president of IGS, as we may recall, uh, vice president of Asia uh, of ISSMG and president of the International Association of Lowland Technology. So it is our honor, Professor Madhav, to have you with us and introduce uh, this uh, series to begin with. Professor Madhav. Good afternoon, all the participants from India. Good evening, Harry, and a very nice morning to you, Mary. It's my pleasure and privilege to start this groundwork of the DFI, being one of those pioneers of working with the ground for the last 50 years. It's my pleasure to give you a slightly different perspective in terms of ground. People think soil and ground are about the same, but what I would like to say is that there is a difference between ground and soil, and also saying that what's it, what is the ground soil got to do with a human being? If I look at a concrete cube or a steel rod, they have specific properties. But when it comes to soil or ground, the properties are not all that uniquely defined because they show some kind of response. And it is somewhat similar to what a human being does. And uh, I would like to quote from our famous founder of the subject. He says, unfortunately, soils are made by nature and not by man. And the products of nature are always complex. I just would like to only change that unfortunately, I would say, I was very fortunate that we are able to deal with a material which is giving challenge as complex as human being or societies. If soil had been a standard material, like once Harry was saying, if the whole ground is like rubber, we don't have any job. It should have been a simple material. We would have been called to do anything. So I would like to give a perspective saying that it is somewhat different because we humans are very complex entities. We don't necessarily have any properties. We may have some numbers, height, etc. But what we have are traits. We can be happy one day, sad another day, angry, or we can be jovial. Where some of the people are extrovert, they like to meet others. Some are introvert, they're friendly, some are friendly, people are, some are misanthropic, some people have positive attitude, few people may have negative one, people can be helpful, neutral, unhelpful, etc. These are all the traits when I describe a human being. Similar to that, if I look at soil, I find that is it strictly an engineering material? It's a porous solid. If it's a weathered material, we call it that. Or it could be a deposited material, then I call it as a sediment. Honestly, I do not know whether to call it as a solid or a liquid because depending on the percentage of water, it can change the behavior from solid to liquid. 
it can exist in a fully saturated or a partially saturated state the behavior is inelastic the recovery is hardly when i unload hardly 10 percent the properties vary in with directions very anisotropic and the properties vary with depth and distance so if i have a site i do not expect an identical profile at every corner of the site soils again are or ground in physically delighted one of the very few materials which increase or decrease in volume with shear stress unlike most other solids which you don't have if i say that we have soils or ground has memory you may think i'm a bit crazy but soils do remember what was the maximum pass pressure and so you know over consolidation ratio is nothing but memory it remembers then it depends how they behave in terms of failure you know some break down very fast you call it brittle otherwise it will be ductile can go on for a lot of pl plastic deformation soils are sensitive to disturbance soft clays obviously they gain in strength with time and under a seismic condition they become liquefiable similar to that i can keep on adding strain hardening strain softening etc then I would like to say that just because I have few, you know, eyes, ears, nose, tongue, etc., which are the visible part of a human body, it doesn't tell anything about the individual. What controls his behavior would be the genetics, the environment, and the personality. So if you look at a human being, you can't just because, you know, most of us are fortunate enough to have these organs, doesn't mean they know us. Our behavior depends on several things. Similarly, the ground, we determine some properties, could be the usual ones and characteristics too. But unless you understand the in situ conditions, the engineering geology, the fluctuations in water table, the stress history or the stress strain path, thick surface, etc., it's always very difficult to predict the behavior of the ground. So both seem to have kind of similar in terms of their material responses. I also would like to draw a practice saying that we go to a doctor for a general checkup, or when we are not well, we go for cure. We have a lot of preventive medicines. Right now, we're all looking for the vaccine to battle the COVID-19. Then we have sports medicine, which will enhance the performance of the sportsmen. And we are using a lot of bioengineering, genetics, and whatnot. We are even producing babies with this kind of advances in medicine and engineering. If I look at geotechnical practice, often we are asked to in, invite it to a site and say, please tell us whether I can build this structure reasonably within a good time frame and cost, that site suitability. Then I also look at failure in spite of our best effort because of nature we're asked to analyze and then we provide rectification we engineer the ground to make it better similarly we can mitigate liquefaction if only we have enough money and willingness to do we're creating lands a lot of them particularly in the east in the last 20 30 years and when we have contaminated land, we go for bioremediation, where we talk of improving the ground conditions. So again, going back to practice of medicine, a doctor diagnosis and use a treatment. The treatment can be prophylactic, that is preventive or therapeutic. It's more post-diagnosis too. And now we have a lot of social and preventive medicine, where like with the vaccine that we're going, it's going to be a preventive medicine. Similar to this, again, I would like to draw the parallel. When I go to a doctor, he looks at the patient history, the family background, the kind of environment in which the individual is located or is working, etc. And then he has some qualitative examination in terms of visual eye stunts. Off late, I would say not many because people are in corporate hospitals, they go for a lot of this modern technology. Then they have several index tests, height, weight, temperature, pulse, blood pressure. Then they go for conventional pathological ones, pathological tests, and X-ray. But in the most modern one, we have ultrasound, CAT scan, and MR. These are the kind of latest developments, or what should I say, recent developments in practice of medicine and diagnosis. 
Similarly, if I look at practice of geotechnical engineering, we go and walk around the site, do a reconnaissance survey, find out if the site is flat, uneven, you know, sloping, projections here and there or depression. Then we always like to look at a Google Earth or satellite or nowadays, we're even going for drone survey. That has been fantastic in terms of identifying several without going exactly close enough to that. We also like to study the site history. Was there a building before? Was it an agricultural land? Was there a hidden um, buried pipeline or services, etc.? Then we go through some of these limits in terms of uh, characteristic, liquid limit, etc. Or if I look at grain size, we find out the amount of sand, silt, clay content. If it is sand, we like to know the shape. Clay content, we would like to know, or the mineral type. Particularly if I'm interested in, say, expansive soil, I would like to know how much of it is a morphogenetic type. If I say I met sand or at the site, doesn't mean anything. I need a state parameter in terms of relative density. That defines what it is. Then we go for the quantitative test where we look at the compressibility, consolidation, permeability, direct shear, triaxial, et cetera. And routine standard tests, SPT, static cone, wind shear, we don't like to do plate load tests, but some people insist it, but pile load tests are something we all carry out too. Then we have more advanced tests, wherein for good project or very important one, we go through stress path control. Uh, we do simple shear through traction. When I go to site, I have now a good option of using pressure meter, dilatometer, piezo cone, seismic cone, or spectral analysis of surface waves, et cetera, so that we have a better insight into the ground conditions. That helps us in trying to identify. Another parallel I have with medicine is, whenever a doctor treats a patient, he gives the medicine or whatever treatment is it, asks him to see after a few days. And if one is cured to say thank you and pay the doctor and that's it. So what he is doing is comparing the pre and post condition. In geotechnical engineering, if you want to be a good geotechnical engineer, you've got to do that, particularly for ground engineering or ground improvement or engineering of ground. Nobody can predict the response 100% accurately. So what we do is we know the condition of the ground before and then what will be the condition after that. So we compare them. So if you want to be a good geotechnical engineer, you have to be not only an engineer, you have to be a doctor, more like a psychologist, clairvoyant, or maybe all of them, but most of all, versatile artists like Terzaghi and of course, Harry Poulos, whom we are going to listen very shortly. I normally like to end up my usual presentation with this sentence or my signature. Geotechnical engineering is a science, but it's practice and art. It's my pleasure to welcome and introduce Harry Poulos. It has been 50 years since we met, 1970 July, if I'm not mistaken, and have been a fantastic association. Harry has been a role model for me and achieved so much that you know, we always look up to him. He joined, Harry joined the Department of Civil Engineering in Sydney in 1965, was appointed professor in 1982, a position he held until his retirement in 2001. In 1989, he joined Coffee and Partners International and currently is currently a senior consultant with Coffee. He's also an emeritus professor at the University of Sydney and adjunct professor at Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. He has been involved in, in any number of high-rise infrastructure projects in Australia and overseas. I mean, you can't just count them, they're infinite. He was selected as, as the Australian in Civil Engineer of the Year in 2003 by the Institution of Engineers Australia and in 2010, was elected a distinguished member of the American Society of Civil Engineers, ASC, in 2014. He was inducted into the US National Academy of Engineering also at the same time. In 2017, he was awarded the Outstanding Leaders and Project, OPAL Award, 
for lifetime achievement award by uh, achievement in design by AFC. And of course, there are quite a few things that he did. He did the Tazagi oration. He was, I think, uh, Kevin Nash gold medal winner. And he was the, I should say, the best president I, ISSMG never had. I wish he had been. And it's a fantastic thing for me to say. He has been a role model for me. And Harry, here you are. So glad to invite you and make your presentation. Well, thank you very much, Professor Madhav. I, I feel very humble because to be uh, given such a, a wind up here and uh, to be named with Tuatzagi, I'm certainly uh, not of that caliber, but uh, it's been a great pleasure interacting with you. And uh, before I start my talk, let me just congratulate uh, India and its cricket team on its fantastic achievement of winning the test today and the test series. A great disappointment for Australia, but a great win for India and for cricket generally. It was uh, a fantastic series and uh, one that I think everybody will remember. Now, getting back to the subject of uh, today's talk, I want to try and share a little bit of uh, my experience with uh, some of the challenges that uh, have uh, brought themselves to bear uh, when designing foundations for tall buildings. Uh, and so what I want to do is just briefly go through these challenges as I see them, uh, outline very briefly a design process for designing uh, foundations for high rise buildings, and then uh, just uh, explain some of the challenges with respect to three projects that I've been fortunate enough to be involved with the Burj Khalifa, Inchon 151 Tower, and the Jeddah Tower in Saudi Arabia. Some years ago, the uh, uh, CTBUH, uh, the, the Council for Tall Buildings and the Urban Habitat, uh, tracked the evolution uh, and the growth in the rate of construction of tall buildings. These are buildings in excess of 300 meters tall. And um, this was uh, a, a, an earlier projection. We've actually exceeded uh, that number in 2020. And so there's no doubt that uh, particularly in the Middle East and in certain parts of Asia, China predominantly, we are still uh, on the accelerating phase of uh, tall building uh, construction. So, when designing foundations for these sort of tall buildings, these are some of the challenges that we face. We have obviously high vertical loads. Uh, the buildings are generally very heavy. Um, and it's interesting that the increase in load uh, is actually more than linear uh, as the height increases because the building has to become larger and more robust. So it's a nonlinear increase in vertical load and weight with height. In many developments, we have adjacent to uh, a very tall tower, lower rise podium areas, and so they're much less heavily loaded. So there is a potential then for differential settlements. Uh, we have uh, high lateral forces and moments from wind loading. Uh, we also, of course, have cyclic components of that loading, so we need to uh, have a look at uh, what that uh, will do to the foundation behavior and strength. And we also, these days, wherever we are, have to consider uh, seismic forces on foundations, which are two types of components. One is inertial, where the structure uh, is actually loading the foundation uh, as the structure itself is being loaded. But the other and more subtle influence is what we call kinematic forces which are induced into the foundation because the ground itself is moving under seismic action. And in addition to that, we also have to be aware of dynamic response issues because if we have 150 uh, story building, uh, we have to make sure that at the top of the building, uh, the acceleration and movement is not sufficient to uh, cause a significant discomfort. Now, some ingredients then that uh, we need to have 
uh, to design these foundations economically and sustain, uh, sustainably. We need to have the right foundation concept. Uh, we need to have appropriate design criteria and methods. We need to have appropriate ground data and design parameters. And then of course, we need to have quality construction. It's almost axiomatic that we need to do pile load testing. Professor Matt have mentioned that uh, in his uh, philosophical introduction. And ideally we need to have uh, performance monitoring so that we can again, check whether what we've assumed is consistent with what we're actually getting in terms of performance. These are the broad uh, options that we have available to us. Uh, if we have a tall building on fairly strong rock, we may be able to get away with a metal raft foundation. But normally, uh, certainly in places like uh, Shanghai and, uh, and, and uh, uh, Japan, various cities of Japan, we need a piled foundation because we're on soil uh, that may be fairly compressible. And in recent years, uh, we've had a combination of these two with the Pile Draft Foundation, which is becoming increasingly recognized. Uh, and a lot of research has been done in the past 10 or 20 years on how this type of foundation responds. And it's a, uh, a very good way in which we can both provide redundancy of performance of the foundation and also uh, reduce the amount of material, particularly concrete, uh, that we use so that we uh, optimize uh, the number of piles uh, and get the raft itself to contribute to the strength and stiffness of the foundation system. <clears throat> In terms of the design issues that we have to address, Obviously, we have ultimate capacity, so we have to make sure that the foundation system itself is stable. Uh, we need to be concerned with settlement and differential settlement and tilt. And quite often, these two issues uh, do actually control the design of tall building foundations. We need to uh, be aware of the response to lateral loads and moments. We need to be able to estimate the dynamic behavior of the foundation because that will influence the dynamic behavior of the structure itself. We need to be able to analyze the response of our foundation system to earthquakes. And then in terms of the structural aspects of the foundations, the first six I've mentioned are all geotechnical aspects, but clearly we also have to design for adequate structural strength of the foundation elements and importantly, long-term durability uh, of the foundation. So that means that we need to be aware of the ground conditions and whether there are any deleterious conditions, acidic soils and so on, that could harm the concrete uh, of the foundation system. <clears throat> When we do design, we usually do it in three stages. The first of these is a preliminary stage, which forms the basis for the development of a concept. So we look at what we need to do broadly. Can we put it all on a raft or do we need piles or can we use a pile raft? And this um, uh, we do with fairly simple tools. Uh, we then do a detail stage, that's where a lot of the work is done in developing and optimizing the design. And here we interact uh, very closely with our structural engineering colleagues because they provide us with the loads, we provide them with the foundation characteristics, and it's an iterative process to get a uh, final solution. And then as a final st uh, stage, uh, what we tend to do uh, is to finalize all the parameters and check uh, our design with a high level analysis and incorporate into that a peer review. And I've indicated in this slide that the design tools that we use in each of those stages needs to be consistent with the stage of design. So for example, there is no point in using a three-dimensional finite element analysis for the preliminary stage because we're just feeling our way. So it, we use relatively simple means to try and get a first estimate of what requirements we will have for the foundation system. Then we can use our 
um, our more detailed tools, and finally, perhaps three-dimensional analyses uh, in the final stage, and in some cases, in the detailed stage. In terms of the analyses that we do, clearly we have to do an ultimate limit state analysis. These days, there's a tendency for design to be uh, a limit state uh, uh, approach. So we look at the ultimate limit state in terms of stability and capacity. We also need to incorporate into that cyclic loading considerations. And what we tend to do is to try and ensure that the cyclic axial load uh, on any pile in the system is not more than about 50% of the shaft friction capacity. We do that so that uh, we tend to minimize the risk of cyclic degradation or loss of capacity under cyclic loading. We need to have appropriate serviceability analyses and requirements. And typically for tall buildings, uh, we try and limit settlements to no more than about 100 millimeters, although that's not an absolute limit. Uh, for example, uh, perhaps uh, Professor Katzenbach in your next series will talk about this, but uh, the Messeterm Tower in Frankfurt uh, has settled to almost 150 millimetres and yet is still performing quite satisfactorily. And in terms of angular rotations, typically we're looking at one in 500 um, as a, a, a differential uh, settlement uh, criterion. Dynamic loading, we need to be able to estimate the natural frequency and damping of the foundation system as uh, that affects the structural response. And with earthquake loading, as we said before, we need to be able to estimate the inertial loads and the kinematic loads through soil movements and make sure that our foundation system can safely resist those loads. The parameters, I'll just very quickly summarize this. The parameters that we need to assess, ultimate shaft friction of piles and end bearing, soil stiffness and modulus under vertical load. And we need to be aware that we have uh, different values for long-term and for short-term loading, uh, because as Professor Madhav said, uh, soil is a complex system. Uh, it just doesn't have a single response. It depends on how quickly uh, you load it. Uh, and so typically short-term stiffness is uh, larger than long-term stiffness. Uh, we need to estimate ultimate lateral pressures uh, for lateral load analyses, and also the soil stiffness or modulus for lateral loading, because that is generally different than for vertical loading. And finally, dynamic soil stiffness and damping of the soil itself. Just a small word here that um, I, I obviously uh, talking about how we get these various parameters is one or more lectures in itself. But I just bring to your attention uh, an important and uh, continue in development, that is that increasingly we are making use of measured shear wave velocities through uh, geophysical investigations to get an estimate of the um, small strain shear modulus, which you can relate by this simple equation uh, to the shear wave velocity. And the shear wave velocity you measure um, by ge geophysical means. And what uh, you can then do is use that as a basis for taking account of stress and strain levels. And typically what we find is that when we come to actually do an analysis of serviceability, uh, that the small strain modulus can be reduced by a factor of around 0.2 to 0.3, uh, and you get quite a reasonable first estimate uh, of the modulus that uh, you can use then for subsequent calculations. In terms of um, soil structure interaction issues, I've just made a note here that when you are dealing with geotechnical uh, resistance and you're checking uh, the structural capacity of the foundation system, you shouldn't factor down uh, the geotechnical resistances because that will limit the load that the pile uh, uh, will have to sustain. And so you shouldn't really factor down geotechnical resistances for structural checks, although obviously for geotechnical capacity checks, you do factor down the geotechnical resistance. Superstructure stiffness can be important because it will affect uh, the settlement and differential settlement. And this is where we interact with our structural colleagues. 
And I've just got a note here uh, about the pile load distribution. Beware of the assumption of a rigid raft. Uh, some of the software that uh, we have available assumes a rigid raft, but you need to be careful because uh, some of the rafts that we deal with, particularly the large ones for tall, tall buildings, uh, are not at all rigid and you can get overestimated pile loads near the outer edges. So that uh, you should really try and take account of the actual raft flexibility. Um, I've made a special note here about cooperation between geotechnical and structural designers. I think this is essential uh, for a successful outcome uh, because as geotechnical designers, one of the key outputs that we provide to our structural colleagues are values of the pile stiffness uh, for each pile within the group. And these stiffnesses really do need to take into account group interaction effects. Otherwise, you can be uh, overly optimistic about the response of the, of the system. And so those stiffnesses are incorporated into the complete structural analysis by our uh, structural colleagues to get more accurate estimates of structural uh, actions and also settlements and differential settlements. So let me <clears throat> now go on to the first of the three cases. This is the uh, now rather famous Burj Dubai as it was then, now the Burj Khalifa. These were some of the original architectural drawings. Uh, and uh, I was fortunate enough to be uh, on a, uh, a peer review team uh, where we worked very closely with the foundation designer Haida in uh, coming up with a foundation system design. The challenges here were that we were dealing with the world's tallest building, so high visibility, high loads and so on. The foundation capacity was somewhat questionable because we were not in really good quality rock, but quite soft rocks and carbonate soils. There were concerns from uh, previous experience that cyclic loading might have a deleterious influence on the capacity of the piles. And we had the, the issue that I mentioned before that we had this extremely tall tower with low rise uh, areas adjacent to it. So there was a potential for significant differential settlement. <clears throat> now this was the site as it was uh, uh, in uh, when we started the site investigation. And I just point out, I don't know whether you can see my cursor here, but uh, these two buildings were the Emirates Twin Towers, which we designed the foundations for, which at the time uh, were the tallest buildings in Dubai. The office tower was 355 metres and the uh, hotel tower was 305 metres, both at that time within the 20 tallest buildings in the world. Uh, they are now uh, barely within the top 100. Uh, there was a lot of site uh, investigation and characterization done. There were 30 boreholes, SPTs, pressure meters, standpipe piezometers, and geophysics via crosshole tomography. Um, and here is the uh, a simplified version of the profile. I won't go into too much detail, but essentially it was a series of layers of cemented uh, calcareous sediments, soft rocks, typically with an undrained shear strength of one to two megapascals. So not very strong, but certainly stronger than many soils. <clears throat> the initial pile design uh, for the tower involved 196 piles, 1.5 meter in diameter and about 47.5 meters long. Supporting the podium, there were a large number of smaller uh, diameter, 0.9 meter diameter piles, 30 meters long, and the raft itself was 3.7 meters uh, under the tower and somewhat thinner under the podium. So that's a relatively thick um, uh, raft, uh, that's uh, 11 or 12 feet, uh, but uh, as you will see, it's not really rigid. <clears throat> This was the configuration. So we had essentially three wings uh, of the tower uh, and there were 190 odd files uh, in that configuration. We uh, and Haida uh, did uh, uh, parallel calculations um, uh, and Haida estimated an average settlement uh, of 
somewhere between 66 and 72 millimetres, and we got something quite similar, 73, 74, with two different types of <coughs> uh, analysis, one using FLAC and one using a program that we had developed ourselves called PIGS. There was a, an extensive load test program <coughs> involving three static compression tests on the large diameter piles, one static compression test on a small diameter pile with shaft grouting in case we didn't get adequate capacity from the ungrouted piles, a cyclic compression test, a static tension test, and a lateral load test. <clears throat> the outcomes of that test were that the large piles were loaded to twice the working load, the small piles to three point times the working load, and none of the piles approached failure. So that was good in terms of the skin friction values being well in excess of our design assumptions. It was found that shaft grading was effective, but wasn't really necessary. The end bearing resistance was not fully mobilized. Uh, so we had even more capacity. The axial stiffness was larger than we predicted. Cyclic loading had little effect and the lateral stiffness was greater than predicted. So all in all, the load test program gave us confidence that if anything, we would be on the conservative side in terms of our design. <clears throat> we also did, I should just show you, uh, this one uh, analysis with uh, our program called PIGS, where we incorporated all the piles, the 196 piles uh, under the tower and then 750 piles uh, under the, uh, uh, the uh, podium, just to get an idea of differential settlements. And we found that they uh, were tolerable. Now, in terms of the measurements that were done, uh, there was quite an extensive uh, program of monitoring. Uh, and uh, as of this date, when the building was pretty much about 80 to 90% completed, we found this sort of measured profile that we had maximum settlement in the middle and significantly smaller settlements uh, uh, on the outer parts of the wings. So that the foundation was in fact dishing. So even though it was 3.7 metres thick, it was still uh, showing uh, relatively flexible behaviour. <clears throat> now these are more detailed uh, measurements across one of the wings uh, of the settlements uh, during construction. This is our prediction of the final profile of settlement and clearly uh, it was likely that uh, we would be uh, conservative and uh, when there were 80% uh, of the dead loads applied the settlement maximum was about 43. So we estimated that the final settlement should be, this is very long term, 50 to 55 millimetres uh, against our 75 or so prediction. So not too bad. Now, unfortunately, I don't have long term settlement measurements. They haven't been released to us, but at least we know that uh, there was a reasonable similarity in what we predicted uh, albeit that it was conservative. Now, just to keep perspective on this, uh, we're talking about 50 or so millimetres of settlement. We should be aware that the building itself, due to its own weight, uh, is likely to shorten by about 300 millimetres. Uh, so uh, that's an interesting thing that we generally don't think about. So in relation uh, to uh, this sort of settlement, our foundation settlement of 50 millimetres or so is not that great. And uh, here are just some quick pictures of the construction process. And uh, here was the grand opening in January 2010. So it's now been up and running uh, for 11 years or more. So a remarkable success. Uh, and uh, it's nice to know that uh, there was some component that we contributed to that project. The next project I want to talk about is the Incheon 151 Tower in South Korea. This is an artist's impression of it. Uh, and um, it's 600 metres tall, uh, or would be, uh, or will be when it's completed. It's on reclaimed land. The geology now is complex. Uh, 
Uh, fortunately, with the Burj Khalifa, the geology was fairly straightforward, uh, basically horizontal layers of cemented materials. This one was quite complex. And as you can see, from the nature of the, the two attached uh, towers, uh, there was limited uh, tolerance to differential settlements. This is the site uh, when uh, the initial ground investigation was being done, so it was underwater. And uh, this is a, uh, a plot uh, from our geologists of the contours to depth of bedrock. And in no way could we uh, employ a single model uh, for the ground conditions here. So we actually had to split this up into eight different soil profiles, uh, uh, which uh, uh, span the, uh, uh, the footprint of the building. So that in itself uh, created a little bit of a challenge in terms of the analysis, but we were able to cope with that reasonably well. <clears throat> a typical geotechnical model, this is one of eight, uh, there was uh, some marine deposits, weathered soil, weathered rock, and what the locals call, called soft rock um, and uh, harder soft rock. And these are some of the properties that we derived. We worked uh, closely here uh, with a local Korean geotechnical firm in coming up with the foundation design. Uh, and it was peer reviewed by uh, Dr. Clyde Baker, uh, who was then with STS in the US. Uh, here's typical core, so you'll see uh, this was not at all attractive in terms of its appearance. This was the so-called soft rock, uh, so it wasn't really that brilliant. Now, the foundation design involved 172 piles, two and a half metre diameter now, so much bigger, and found it well into the, uh, the, the deeper soft rock, and now the raft thickness was 5.5 meters, so a thicker raft. This is the foundation layout, so we have a central core and then we have now four wings. Um, the results of the overall stability analysis, uh, we used geotechnical reduction factors that were based on uh, the amount of geotechnical information and the quality of geotechnical information we had, various other factors. We used smaller factors for lateral load because we were concerned that we were dealing uh, with uh, the foundation being on reclaimed land. And so the lateral response is much more uh, dependent on the near ground, uh, near surface condition of the soils than is the, the vertical behavior. But fortunately, in all cases, the foundation system was found to be stable. We had something like two uh, dozen or so load cases to analyze. We also checked the cyclic loads and uh, for each of the piles uh, under the extreme wind loadings. And we found that at worst, the maximum ratio of the cyclic load to the shaft load capacity was less than 50%, which was one of our design criteria. Uh, we did a final design check using three-dimensional uh, finite element analysis with Plaxus 3D, just to make sure that uh, we were on the right track and that uh, we weren't overlooking some of the beneficial effects of, uh, for example, the basement uh, slab uh, and raft, uh, which will help to reduce the, uh, the bending moments in the piles. And one of the nice things about <clears throat> this type of analysis is that you get a visualization of how the, uh, the building responds with and without uh, the basement uh, contact. It it's just helps us to understand foundation behavior. Now, it's interesting that um, in the three stages that we did, we estimated settlements. The first of these, we used an equivalent peer analysis, probably took about 15 to 20 minutes to do. We got about 75 millimeters. In our detailed design using one of the programs we've developed for pile drafts, we got a maximum of about 67 millimeters. And in the Plaxus analysis, which took about two days, GARP took about maybe two or three hours to run, uh, we got 56 millimeters. So it was nice to, uh, be able to start with a crude number and refine it as we went along. There was quite a lot of uh, 
uh, testing done with uh, the Osterberg cell to try and estimate capacity and stiffness of the piles. Um, and uh, to cut a long story short, uh, these are the design values that we had assumed. The measured values uh, from those load tests uh, were in some cases almost twice as large as we had presumed. Uh, and so our design parameters were conservative. And so uh, we were about to uh, reanalyze the foundation system uh, when the project was put on ice because of financial reasons. And I'm afraid it remains on ice. Um, the final uh, project I want to just to briefly mention is the Diamond Tower in Jeddah in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. This is uh, architecturally uh, rather an intriguing building. Uh, we were asked to uh, provide some guidance on settlements and the effects of limestone cavities because they had been identified. And uh, in the city of Jeddah in, in Saudi Arabia, limestone cavities uh, are very frequently uh, encountered. And so there was a concern about the potential for building tilt. Now, the challenges here, apart from that, were that this is a building uh, that was to be 398 metres tall, so quite a tall building. Uh, this was the profile. So it consisted, uh, the geotechnical condi conditions consisted largely of limestone, but uh, pretty poor quality limestone. The RQD, for those of you familiar with that, was generally near zero, and the core recovery uh, was not much better than about five to 10%. So not high quality rock uh, in that uh, critical area. The tower itself, uh, the design was done by other people, but we came in to do uh, this settlement investigation. Uh, the raft itself was five and a half metres thick, 145 board piles, one and a half metres in diameter, 40 metres long, and uh, the serviceability load was uh, uh, 2,859 meganewtons. This is the pile layout, so quite a regular layout um, by the original designers. I suspect we probably could have done better if we had to optimise it, but that was the design uh, layout that we were given. And what we did uh, in our analysis is that we used uh, here, because of the necessary complexity, we used a three-dimensional <coughs> plexus analysis, but we generated random cavities on the basis of the uh, site investigation. Uh, so we had uh, uh, generated uh, random numbers to uh, uh, indicate uh, the size and the location uh, of uh, various cavities in the system. And we analyzed the number of those. And of course, I don't have time to go into detail here, but what we found was that a single cavity caused maybe two to three millimeters increase in settlement. Multiple cavities uh, could increase the settlement by probably even up to 20 millimetres, depending on where those cavities were. And so one of the consequences of cavities is that even though your loading may be symmetrical, your settlement pattern can be non-symmetrical because the foundation conditions aren't uniform. Um, so, sorry, let me just go, yeah. Uh, this is uh, an example then uh, of the, the settlement pattern uh, that you get because of randomly located cavities. So it's no longer symmetrical. And also it influences the distribution of bending moments in the raft. This is if you have no cavities, you get pretty symmetrical situations. With cavities, you get an asymmetric distribution of bending moments. Uh, but in this case, the largest increase in bending moment was only about 13% uh, for those cavities that we investigated. So the observations from these analyses, which we sent back to our client, was that uh, yes, you could get some increases in settlement due to cavities. A single cavity is not uh, that important, uh, but uh, multiple cavities uh, can be. Uh, they can add to the settlement by maybe 15 to 20 millimetres, and the settlement pattern can be non-symmetrical. But um, I think one of the 
interesting and important things is that the effects were not as great as some might have feared because we did have here a redundant foundation system in that we also had not only the piles uh, supporting the load, but we also had the raft supporting the load. So if we had a pile in a cavity, the raft area in uh, the vicinity of that uh, defective pile could assist uh, in uh, carrying the load and providing stiffness. So if I can then just summarize, um, I think uh, when we do this sort of uh, analysis, um, we have three stages of analysis and we have three sets of analyses that we need to look at. We need to look at overall stability, we need to look at serviceability, and we need to look at structural design and the loads that uh, the raft and the piles uh, can withstand or have to withstand. And we also need to assess the cyclic loading effects. Um, to meet the challenges uh, that we have these days, increasingly, uh, and I think this again uh, was echoed by Professor Madhav, we are now in a position where we can use modern methods of in situ testing, laboratory testing, and analysis and design methods. And I, I think it's probably true to say that uh, the progress that we've made in analysis and design methods has probably outpaced our ability to accurately quantify uh, the, the ground conditions. We're still uh, struggling with appropriate characterization of the ground. It's important though um, to uh, emphasize that simpler methods uh, can and must be used to check on advanced numerical analyses. Because uh, my view, of course, is that these three-dimensional finite element analyses uh, are somewhat like black boxes and we don't really have full control over those. And so doing a simple check allows us to have confidence, uh, hopefully, in the results of our advanced analyses. And finally, I think for success, uh, then we need to have cooperation between geotechnical and structural designers. Thank you very much. Wonderful talk, uh, Professor Polis. Uh, we have quite exciting questions. I think people have a lot of queries. So uh, I'll probably throw some of the questions. Maybe I will be rephrasing some of the some of the questions as well. Okay, I'll do my best to answer. I'm sure. <laughs> so first question is from Din Mr. Dinesh Kumar Malviya. Uh, he's yes. uh, uh, asking what kind of method was used for analysis of pile draft foundation. He's quoting uh, equivalent draft and equivalent pier method. And he's asking, is there any particular reference that you would recommend for that kind of analysis? Uh, yes, that's a good question. Uh, the analysis we used was one called GARP, which I and uh, my uh, colleague, Professor John Small, developed. So that's a proprietary program within Coffees. Now, uh, the equivalent raft and equivalent peer method is what we would use in a preliminary stage analysis. And that's the sort of thing that we do and did, and that's where my, in the uh, inch on tower, that's what we did. It was a 10 or 15 minute calculation. Now there is, uh, uh, of course, you can also use three dimensional finite element analysis, but that's really on the, the latter stages. There is a commercial program now available called ELPLA, E-L-P-L-A, uh, which if you look up uh, on the web, you can actually purchase. I've used it. It's um, quite, a, quite a nice program. Uh, and um, I mean, I haven't explored it fully, but you'll find quite a lot of literature uh, from the uh, developers of that program. So in terms of programs that are perhaps uh, within the detailed phase design, but less uh, uh, ex exotic uh, than Plaxus, that LPLA may provide at least some accessible uh, uh, software. Okay, uh, so next question is from Mr. Ali Gill. Uh, he's asking, uh, how were the cavities modeled in Plaxus? 
Okay, uh, what we did there was we actually <laughs> excavated out little bits of soil. Uh, I did, my colleague, Dr. Helen Chow did this, so please don't ask me for absolute details, but these were sort of, it was almost like creating little tunnels uh, within the ground, but enclosed tunnels. So we just took um, where we had uh, randomly located uh, the, um, uh, the cavities, we took out the ground there and then just loaded the uh, foundation system. Uh, next question is from Mr. K. Suresh. Uh, he's asking you, in one of the towers, you had limestone in the foundation. Yes, ground. yes. And uh, the, what was the groundwater table there? And uh, what are the precautions that were thought of? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, this uh, particular building is very close to uh, uh, the seashore. And so the groundwater level is fairly high. And I think always with, with limestone, uh, you have to be very uh, concerned about the possibility that uh, if there is, particularly if there's flow of groundwater, that uh, you may uh, increase the size of the cavities uh, over time. Now, one of the advantages of using a piled raft system is that uh, the effects of those developed cavities uh, can be overcome by redistribution uh, of uh, uh, the loads uh, if you have enough piles and adequate level of redundancy. That's in a sense what we try to uh, simulate in a rather crude way, even though that the analysis was complex, what we did was in some ways rather crude, but what it did indicate was that even if we did get these cavities, which were, I think, bigger than we had actually encountered, but we assumed that they could get bigger, uh, that it still wouldn't be catastrophic. Uh, next question is from, again, from Ali, Mr. Ali Gill. Uh, he's asking, uh, how did you decide about the soil elastic modulus or elastic modulus of soil? And was it, he's quoting E25 or E50 kind of thing. But uh, uh, mainly, uh, how was it decided? Yeah. An excellent question. Uh, let me um, tell you with respect to uh, the Burj Khalifa, uh, we had, um, uh, stress path tests carried out in the UK where we tried to simulate the stress path of soil adjacent to the piles. Uh, we also had uh, uh, shear wave velocity measurements. So we got an initial shear wave velocity, uh, an initial shear modulus and converted that to a Young's modulus. And uh, then uh, one of the nice things about doing pile load tests is that you can back figure the pile load tests and get a more accurate in situ value of modulus. So we did all of these things in trying to get uh, an appropriate modulus value. You cannot uh, get it from E25 or E50 from a conventional triaxial test because the stress conditions are quite different. And so you need to be very careful that if you do a laboratory test, you try and simulate the appropriate stress path and stress conditions. Thanks. Uh, so next question is from Mr. Yunus Eski. Uh, he's a student from Isaac University. Uh, he's asking, uh, uh, I think you have mentioned about some computer programs that have been used in these yes. projects, but if you would like to add any new computer softwares or recommend any. Uh, look, not beyond those that uh, I have mentioned. I think uh, uh, the people that uh, uh, are developing the a commercially available program called Repute in the UK are working on a piled raft uh, program, an extension of Repute so that you can model the stiffness uh, of the raft as well as the piles. Repute itself uh, is, is a nice program for pile groups and I've uh, done comparisons with the developer on uh, our, our program, the GARP program and his Repute program. And they seem to, to give quite compatible results, but I don't think that that is yet commercially available. But keep an eye out on their website um, uh, and uh, hopefully it will be available uh, in the not too distant future. Uh, next one is from Mr. Prashant Kumar C. He's asking, there were some cyclic load tests done on working piles. 
Yes. Uh, is there any special care required in that? And how would that impact the mobilized skin friction? Yeah, good question. Um, what what we did was uh, in one of the paths, we, we cycled between what we estimated to be the maximum and minimum axial loads. And then we loaded the pile up as far as we could go. But there was very little accumulated settlement uh, within that range of cyclic loading. And the skin friction that we managed to mobilize was essentially unaffected as compared with the piles where there was no cyclic loading. So in this particular case, and because of the size and capacity of the piles, uh, there was no uh, potential, no serious potential uh, for cyclic degradation. This is not always the case, particularly, I suppose, these days, I think we're, we're all uh, now aware of uh, some of these offshore wind farm foundations. They've got substantial uh, cyclic loads, both vertical and lateral. And so cyclic loading there is a much bigger issue than perhaps with tall buildings. So I'll bother you with a couple of more questions, but then we'll stop. Sure. Uh, sure. So one quick one is, uh, would you like to comment on how the joints in rock could be modeled in flak? Ah, uh, probably not. I, I mean, I I am not a um, uh, not a, an avid user of flak. I've used it uh, in a almost uh, uh, in a schoolboy manner. Uh, I'm impressed by its power. But let me say that one of the nice things about uh, doing um, geophysical investigations and measuring uh, shear wave velocities, particularly cross hole, is that if you have uh, joints in the rock, then the shear wave velocity will be influenced by those joints. And so if you are like myself, simple minded, then the modulus that you derive from those geophysical measurements do in some way take account of that jointing. And that's why I love geophysics because I think it gives us so much more useful data than we have just by testing little bits of soil. I do love geophysics, that's for sure. <laughs> so that question, last one was from P. Rajendra Kumar from NIT Trichy. Uh, the next right. one is from Mr. Hamid Alaldi, Alalahi. Uh, he's asking, uh, was there any consideration to seismic soil structure and interaction in the design? Uh, yes, we looked at, um, uh, in a somewhat simplified way, um, obviously the inertial effects uh, and the lateral loads uh, coming from uh, earthquakes were provided to us by the structural engineer. And it turns out, like many tall buildings, that those inertial loads are much less than the wind induced loads. So wind in terms of inertial loads is much more important. But we also looked at the kinematic effects and checked that the uh, induced bending moments that we might have from an anticipated magnitude of earthquake were within the structural capacity of the piles. And they were. We used a fairly simple analysis, one of the uh, methods that uh, appeared in Geotechnique now almost 20 years ago, a paper by Nicolau and Gazettas. Uh, but uh, I found that to be a very useful uh, first estimate. Okay. Uh, one last question uh, yes. from Professor yes. B. Uma Shankar from IIT Hyderabad. Uh, was the soil modulus as a function of its state along the pile considered or a representative modulus was considered for the entire pile length? <clears throat> oh no, we tried okay. to uh, we, we tried to um, get appropriate values of the soil modulus uh, uh, for different uh, layers within the soil profile. So no, we didn't try and use a, a single uniform modulus. Uh, I mean, you perhaps can derive one, but if you've got uh, the data that allows you to uh, model variable modulus, then it's always preferable to use that. So I think I said that was last question, but uh, one more question that is of my interest as well. So probably yes. I'll throw that again. <laughs> All right. So that no is, problem. how was the cavities characterized on the ground? Was there any ground penetrating radar used? Yeah. Um, no, look, it wasn't. Um, the 
characterization was, I have to admit, crude. It was based on quite a significant number of boreholes and uh, the loss of core, which we uh, or the, the engineer attributed to the possible uh, prevalence of uh, cavities. So it was on that basis that we sort of identified where those cavities might be uh, and what size they might be and grow to. But it was, I mean, in a sense, it was, um, uh, I, I perhaps uh, might be uh, uh, called judgment, but probably uh, guesswork would be a more accurate uh, estimate, but it was it was perhaps uh, educated guess. So thank you. I think it was wonderful listening to you and all the candid answering all of the questions and very clear. Uh, I think understanding we could have from that uh, conversation. And we have some more questions, but I will leave it uh, for future probably. And uh, with that, uh, we are really grateful for the purpose. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. So uh, next one, uh, we have another interesting uh, discussion by Ms. Mary Allen Large on professional development uh, aspects. Uh, she is the responsible for assisting technical aspects and com of commercial research publications, seminars, uh, journal magazine, and strategic planning at DFI. Hi, Mary. How are you? Hello. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Uh, she's a BS degree in civil engineering from uh, University of Maryland, an MS uh, in geotechnical engineering from Cornell, which is a beautiful university. If you have not been there, please visit it, I guess, right? It is. Um, so she has over 25 years of experience in geotechnical, environmental, and deep foundations. She worked for major consulting engineering firms uh, before founding Geotechnica. Uh, Incorporation in 1998, a certified woman-owned geotechnical engineering consultants. She has authored, co-authored technical papers in micropiles, deep mixing, ground anchors, that's her research interest as well. And she has practiced, participated in FSWA and National Highway Institute programs on micropiles, and she served as FSWA's principal investigator for design manual on deep mixing for embankments and foundations. She is a professional engineer in Pennsylvania, New York, and Michigan. Uh, a member of ADSC, ASC, ASTM, Psy Epsilon, DFI, Engineers Without Borders, TRB, and a diplomat of geotechnical engineer and lovely associate for DFI as well. So Thanks. welcome, Thanks. Mary. Uh, looking forward to your talk. Thank what you. you. Thank you so much. So it is it is such a pleasure to be with you all today, and I am, I'm very excited. DFI does a lot of programs, but I am very excited about this very first groundwork program, a student, a student program for professional development as well as technical development. So this is uh, DFI, this is an international program, and um, DFI of India is our first to launch the first webinar in this series. So welcome, and thank you so much for being with us. This presentation is about body language. And it might seem like an unusual thing to, to present, but as part of this series, we're doing technical presentations and also trying to provide some additional professional and personal growth topics involved in this series. So this is the, this again is the first in this series. Okay. so. Communication is one of the one of the topics that employers ask for all the time. So students are always asking me, what are employers looking for? And, and employers are looking for communication. It's always one skills. It's one of the, the top three skills that that employers are, are always asking for. And so our profession is consistently hailed good and excellent communication skills is essential um, for the workplace. And ASCE, our American Society of Civil Engineers, back in 2006, they were looking at the future and they were crafting a vision of what a civil engineer would look like in 2025. So when they did this in 2006, it seemed like a long time ago um, in the future, but it's really right around the corner. Um, they, they crafted, they had a summit and, and several days talking about this and they decided upon three main aspects, knowledge, skills, and attitudes.
So knowledge, knowledge are your fundamental, uh, your fundamental educational tools, right? It's your theories, your principles, your fundamentals, so what you're learning in your university. So it's all of these things. Your skills are your ability to do tasks. They're your problem solving, your communication skills, your collaboration, your, your ability to manage and lead. And your attitudes are your creativity, your commitment, your curiosity, your optimism, like how you do your work. And so the level of discussion related to skills and attitudes was just as lengthy and involved as knowledge. So indicating that there's a high value placed on those items and, and particularly communication. So DFI's technical committees have also realized this. Oh, excuse me, I went, went too far. And, and as part of DFI, we have 28 technical committees and one of the strategic planning goals for DFI uh, for the past five years was to increase our, re revitalize our committees. And one of the main um, strategies we were doing, we were undertaking to pursue that is, is to enhance our communication. So every year at our annual conference, we have a committee meeting day and it's a crazy long day of 25 committee meetings on, the, on a single day. And during the lunchtime, we have a workshop. And the workshop is, is just like this. It's professional development skills and trying to incorporate a little bit of personal growth in, in along with our, with our technical learning and our technical projects. So we have this communication series called, What Did You Say? And this presentation on body language was the first of that series of communication skills uh, workshops. So we are not communication experts, so, but we found some interesting tools and topics that we shared during that workshop. And this is an encore presentation of that workshop. Okay, so some of this, some of the content for today's presentation was based on the Stanford, uh, the Graduate School of, of Business at Stanford. And these great students put on a workshop and um, based on a course that they taught on communication skills. And this, this link here, and we're gonna include this in the, in the materials, this link here is, uh, it shows their presentation to their fellow students on their body, on body language. And it is really fun. It's called Body Language is Your Super Superpower. So I would encourage you to, to check that out. Oops, I didn't wanna do that. Hold on, thank you. Thanks, Pranav. I just clicked in the wrong place. Okay, so body language can, can play a powerful role when you speak, okay? It can enhance your message or it can detract from your message. And so we're gonna watch a very quick video to start this discussion. Um, for, uh, including Michael Bay. So Michael Bay is a world famous director of high action explosive movies, the Transformers series. And um, he was giving a presentation at Samsung Showcase in 2014. And he, uh, we're, I'm gonna let this, the video, you watch the video. It's a little bit dark, but you should see, be able to see what we're he saying here and then we'll talk about it. But watch his body language, please. Ladies and gentlemen, director and producer, Michael Bay. Good afternoon. Thanks, Joe. Good afternoon, Thanks, Michael. Joe. How is everyone today? Uh, my job as a director is I get to dream for a living. Michael, you know, you're known for such unbelievable action. What, what inspires you? How, how do you come up with these unbelievable ideas? Um, I create visual worlds that are so beyond every, everyone's normal life experiences. And Hollywood is a place that creates uh, a viewer escape. And um, what I try to do is, I, as a director, I try to... Uh, the type is all off, sorry, but I'll just wing this. Tell us what you think. Yeah, we'll just, we'll, we'll wing it right now. Um, I, take, I try to take people on an emotional ride. 
And um, the curve? How does it? Uh, how do you think it's going to impact uh, how viewers experience your movies? Excuse me. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, let's thank Michael Bay for joining us. Okay, so uh, that was a little hard to watch. I mean, you really felt for him, but you could see how uncomfortable he was. You could see how he was looking down. He was wringing his hands. He was turning his back away from the, office, um, the audience. He was looking at anything but the audience. Um, because he was so uncomfortable. So his body language was really speaking to um, to his his level of comfort or discomfort, I should say. So so that was an example of how body language detracted from his message. But body language can also enhance your message. So so the next thing we're going to talk about is is gesturing, right? So gesturing is a way to enhance your message and and studies have shown that just when you do when you use gestures the audience remembers twice as much as if you're not using gestures and i talk with my hands all the time but there so we're going to talk about gestures and we're going to talk about stances so there's three stances that can be that are commonly used but can sometimes be distracting so if you're standing with your hands in your pockets your shoulders are kind of rolled forward your, um, it's very casual, it's difficult, it, it, it appears to be have low energy. So it's, it's hard to convey a, a strong message with your hands in your pockets. Um, on the other hand, a hand, on your hips is authoritative and it's powerful. And, and that's great at times, but it could also be overpowering. So you'd wanna watch where you use that in, in your, your professional uh, presentations. A fig leaf is when you hold your hands kind of in front of your body, kind of clasped in front of your body, and that your shoulders are rolled forward again. You're a little, it, you might come off a little timid, um, and it's tricky to gesture from that from that position as well. Um, a natural stance is you can create your natural steps or, or find your natural stance by closing your eyes, you raise your arms, and just drop them. And that's your natural stance. And so the st so gesturing from that position is natural and it's comfortable. Okay. All right, now gestures. So again, gestures give you, give the audience, it, it allows the audience to retain more. So there's three typical, three types of gestures. So one is the give, one is the show, and one is a chop. Okay, so a give, it relays facts to the audience. So you want to perform the gesture, you want to perform a give with your with your palm up. And we'll talk about a palm up in just a moment. You want to be sure that you're that you're loose when you do that, right? You don't want your elbows in tight because then you'll look like a T-Rex, right? So you want to make sure that you're loose and you can gesture comfortably. The show enhances your message. So you can okay, you can do it's anything. You can be creative with with a show but you have to be sure that your gesture matches what you're trying to say so you wouldn't want to say of course you wouldn't want to say profits are rising I mean, you want to say profits are rising right so you want to make sure that it's congruent with your with the message and then a chop is emphasis you can chop with one hand you can chop with two hands and that shows a strong um, opinion Okay, so palm up. So when you're ge re regarding gesturing with your palm up, if you use your, it, this was an interesting study. So if I say people on the left stand up and move to the right, Pete, with that palm up um, orientation of your hand, people will retain 84% of what you said. If you palm down, people on the left stand up and move to the right. That would be 52% with your palm down. I don't know why, it's just what happens. If you're pointing at people, say people on the left, stand up and move to the right, people only retain 28%. People do not like to be pointed at, right? And so it's it's not a good idea. And people only retain 28% of what you said. So 
we say that hasn't worked in the past and it still doesn't work. So it's not a good idea. Okay. All right, so now that we've talked a little bit about delivering your message, you also want to read your audience when you're when you are um, through through body language, right? And so I don't know if you've ever seen an audience like that. You've ever been an audience like that. Hopefully, you're not an audience like that right now. I can't see you, but uh, it's it's not fun talking to an audience like this. So before the situation gets to this point, let's try to learn to read our audience. So the next few slides, we're going to we're going to show some pictures of of audiences and then if you could chat into the question box the what the audience is feeling and then we'll talk about it okay so the so if you could chat into the question box is this audience disapproving confused thinking or bored so if you could just put it in there and we'll just leave it a second to see some of the some of the answers come through <clears throat> Yeah, sometimes these are a little tricky. Sometimes some of them look similar and it's there's not for, for the similar answers, there's not really there's not really wrong answers. So just throw a throw a few answers in there. Okay, so this peep this this these people are thinking, right? And so and it's hard, it's it, it these these pictures are a little hard because there's several people in it and and some people might look bored and some people might look thinking, but overall these people are thinking. And you can tell that they're thinking because the hands are a number one clue here. Hands are either clasped together or they're on their they're on their mouths. They're near their faces. They stroke their chins. Um, they can put their hands close to their mouths. It's a it's a relaxed position. Like they're just kind of thinking about what you're about what you're saying. So the hands are a clue here. All right. So the next slide. Okay, what about this one? So is this audience interested, angry, engaged, or bored? Bored, I think the guy in the right hand, bottom, right hand side is, is a dead giveaway, but boredom, it immediately blocks your ability to get your message across to your audience, right? People start to shut down and tune out. Their posture changes, right? They might slump sideways. They might support their hand on their, you know, their, their chin on their hand. Um, they're easily distracted. That's the, the first thing to do is, is pull out their phone and start figuring out who's texting them. Um, there's loss of eye contact. Um, people are looking away or they're closing their eyes. Um, so you have to do something. When you see your audience doing this, you can change the tone of your voice, you can move around a little more, you can inter interject some interactions. So ask, some pe ask people some questions and try to get that message um, more invigorated. Okay, how about this audience? Is this audience thinking, negative, neutral, or bored? Now, again, there's so many people in here, it might be a little bit tricky to see, but. Okay, I think you guys are getting it. So neutral, neutral. Yes, these, these, this is neutral. And uh, neutral is not necessarily a bad thing because all of our presentations start out neutral, right? Because you're trying, you, the audience doesn't know whether what you're saying is relevant. They don't know whether to believe you. You can tell whether an audience is neutral because they're sort of blank. Their, their faces are blank. They're not really smiling. They're not really frowning. And their body language is, is upright or slightly leaning forward. So they're trying to move away from being neutral into being something else, whatever it is, negative or positive. So um, it's uh, neutral is a, is a good place to start, but it's not necessarily where you want to stay. 
How about this next one? Is this audience confused, negative, engaged, or accepting? Okay. Yeah, we're getting a whole mix of answers. These are, it's tricky when there's a lot of people in the picture. So this audience could be perceived as negative. Look at the fellow in the front with the hat on. He's got his arms crossed. Um, some of the faces, the lady on the left with the glasses, she's, she's not looking like she's, like she's buying what's being sold right there. Um, there's a, hand, you know, a handful of unhappy faces. You're gonna be pretty easily seeing that you have a negative, you have a, a negative audience, but you can catch some other subtle signs, right? You, the people are uncomfortable. They're trying to get away. So the fella in the, with the white shirt and the dark jacket, he's kind of turning away. Arms are folded, um, legs can be crossed sometimes. They might touch their neck. You know, when something's negative, you're a little uncomfortable with it. You're just trying to pacify yourself unconsciously a little bit. Um, if you feel like you're making someone uncomfortable, you just don't worry, just, just move on from your point. Wrap your point up and move on to the next, to the next uh, point that you'd like to make. Okay. Next one, is this audience bored, accepting, impatient, or zoned out? So this audience could be impatient, you could interpret them as being impatient. So sometimes your story or your tangent is going on too long and your audience will wanna move on. So looking for a quick head nods where people are like, okay, okay, yes, I get the point, move forward is what they're trying to indicate to you. Um, they get, they get in, um, active with their feet. So if, um, impatience can sometimes turn to irritation. And then because they can't control what you're doing because you're up there, for, up there speaking, then they get disinterested and then they turn to boredom, which is really not what you want because people are completely disengaged from your message then. So you wanna pick up the pace. If you find people are getting impatient, pick up the pace and move on quickly to the next point. Okay, we're almost done. Is this audience agreeing, confused, judging, or bored? Yeah, this one could be confused or judging, you think, right? Confused, be on the lookout for confused faces. So I can't see any of your faces, so hopefully no one's confused here, but confused typically looks asymmetric, right? Like you might have your head tilted to the side. You might have one eye kind of squinted. You might have an eye raised. Um, you, they might quickly scan around the room to see if anybody else is looking confused too. Um, they might cover their mouth. Um, you may need to go back on your point. You, want, you might wanna ask them, if you start to see confused faces, you might wanna say, may I, can, you know, can I repeat that? Can I explain that? Would anybody like me to review that material again? And uh, you could go and explain it more slowly or you can explain it in a different way. Okay, what about this one? Is this audience interested, agreeing, bored, or negative? All right, interested and agreeing, right? So agreeing, so smiles are, in, are a great indication of agreements and acceptance. Bright, wide smiles and eye contact and nodding are telltale signs that your audience agrees with what you're saying, they're having a good time. So audience members will lean slightly towards you. They may tilt their head. Um, they will, the, the posture's upright and attentive. Okay. And our last one here is, how about this one? Bored, thinking, interested, or confused? Interested, yep. Interested. So slow, slow head nods indicate agreement, understanding, and acceptance. Right? So fast ones are okay. Come on, let's go. Move on to your next point. Slow nods are 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 uh, acceptance and agreement. An eyebrow raised, um, a slight head tilt, and means that something's new or interesting to them. So that's uh, that's. Uh, just, just a quick run through of some of the typical body language that you could try to read from your audience to make sure that your message is getting across.
So that was only one of the topics that we described in uh, that, that we're presenting in that What Did You Say series at, at DFI. Um, these are some of the other ones. If there are other, other topics, say, in this series or other professional topics just in general that you'd like this series to present, we would welcome your feedback. And I think a survey will go out after this, so please fill it out and let us know if there are some other topics that, um, that we could provide that would be fun to learn about. So... I think that's it. That's it. And, and I'm, I'm so happy to answer any of your questions. Or if you if you wanted to email me, if you had a question just about the industry or about about any of these professional development topics or to talk about your, your progress, I would just, just love to talk. We love to talk to the students. So please don't hesitate to email. Very interesting, Mary. <laughs> Thank you. A lot, lot of things to learn. <laughs> Yes. I, I gave some wrong answers up too, actually. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <But> I, <laughs> I think it was a little bit intriguing. Yeah. 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 So, so we have some questions, actually. So one question from Dinesh Kumar Malviya from Roorkee is asking very nice. And uh, can you throw some light on what kind of special things we should keep in mind while giving technical talks? Well, I mean, personally, I think you have to be prepared. Right. I mean, pre pre there is no substitute for preparation right? and know your material and don't try to last minute anything because that just never works. I don't know if anybody of you, any of you have been in a present in a, in a meeting with a professor or a boss where, you know, you there's just one thing that you're not unsure about and they always find that thing. And then I don't understand how that happens, but it does. So be prepared. And. The other thing I always try to remember um, to tell students is, is be confident, right? That, that everyone wants you to do well. And you know more about that subject than the people that you're, te that you're telling it to. It doesn't matter if you're junior. On that thing, you know. So be confident. I remember I was told that in my master's defense, that you know more about what you've done. So be confident and and project what you know that's would be my advice wonderful wonderful so i have a question you mentioned about attitude in the beginning of the talk right and when we do our uh, education we are never told about attitude and all those things we are always about analysis conclusion this and that right so but how much success in profession depends on attitude itself I and that we have to learn on our own you know, I, I really think it's a great deal uh, because I think it's your ability to accept new tasks, willing to be game for things, right? Say yes. You know, they want to give, they want to give you responsibility. They want you to, there's, there's something to be said for, you know, this sounds basic, but walk in, chew gum at the same time, right? You want to be able to, you know, converse with people. People end up working with the people that they like. Right. So so bring your personality to your to your job, your curiosity, your optimism, your I think that it's it's easier to give a task as a manager to someone who will readily try and accept and then then ask for help. Right. I mean, you're not going to know everything and, and you may stumble, but say yes to a challenge and then ask for help when when you get stuck before you're super stuck as you find yourself slowing down and and you get in that picking up some some traction there ask for help and and not be afraid of doing that i think that those it's, it shows respect for the task you've been given it shows respect for the person that gave it to you if you want to do a good job it is not a sign of weakness or um or or in uh, or lack of capability it's actually very uh, responsible, I think. And I think all of so that. One matters. last thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One last thing. I think. Uh, uh, how would this kind of platform benefit many of these students on some of these topics? And what are those topics uh, where DFI India student chapter can be really helpful in those things? Well, I think so. Our goal is to is to round you, round students out, right? Round uh, as in, in professional tasks, because you don't know what those professional tasks are right now. And we also want to encourage you to participate in DFI. We love when the students are, are involved. So our next presentations are about 
are, are about writing and reviewing abstracts and writing and reviewing papers because we want you to be part of the technical conversation in the professional society. And then negotiating. I think negotiating is something that we don't do very, very well. I, I know that I don't do it very well. I, I wait, and, you know, I, I, should, I should deserve this. So I'm gonna wait until, I, until someone gives it to me. But there's nothing wrong with asking and negotiating your position. And so those are the next two topics that we're going, going to present. But there's a whole series like presentation skills and all kinds of, of things that, that help and enhance. So that's our that that's our plan. And we welcome any ideas. So if you have ideas for, for new topics, we would we would you know be all ears. Wonderful, wonderful. So there's one uh, question or comment from uh, Mrs. Dola Rai Chaudhary, who is a consultant. Okay. Uh, shouldn't communication be a part of curriculum itself in all engineering colleges? You know, I, I think so, um, um, Ms. Dola. I, I, do, I do think so. Um, and because it's an easy, fun class for some people, I, 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 don't, I don't want to, to, maybe I shouldn't be so broad. I, I am an extrovert and there are people that are less so, but you have to work in a team. And, and, and in, in engineering teams, you really have to work together and you have to communicate. And, and really every relationship that you have in your life, the fundamental basis is communication. And so um, there's lots of different ways to hone your own style of communication. It is something that I think can be taught though, the basics. Yeah, I agree, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, connected uh, extension to that question is, uh, would entrepreneurship be enhanced if you have good communication skills? You know, I think so. Uh, yes, I, I think so. So I started my own my own consultancy. So I, I would be considered an entrepreneur myself, but you have to put yourself out there. And so you have to be confident. You have to state your, your uh scope of services, you have to clearly lay out a business plan. And all of those are communication skills, be they're written, um, verbal. Um, you, you really have to be very clear about your understanding of what you're gonna do and your and when, you, when you're soliciting work for your business as an entrepreneur. So I think communication is, is huge for entrepreneurs. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you, Mary. I think we are reaching a point of uh, conclusion now. Yes. And we are really thank thankful you. to you. Any thank last you remarks pleasure. you want to make? No, thank you. I just, just, and if you, if you have questions or, or have any other ideas where we would welcome them and this is your seminar students. This is so if you are interested in a topic, please share it with us. We, we'd love to hear from you. Okay. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks. So uh, with that, uh, I think uh, we would like to inform you and invite you to the next webinar uh, of similar kind with interesting topic. Professor Karzenbach, uh, who has done wonderful work and designed many, uh, you can say, iconic buildings in Germany and outside. Uh, I think it will be very interesting. And I was fortunate enough to meet him and spend a few weeks with him. And it will be interesting to listen to him. And uh, uh, we will continue that with abstract writing, as uh, Mary mentioned, with Professor Anne Luminis. Uh, uh, the date is 15, 16th Feb, uh, as tentatively right now, but we will communicate with you uh, for the final date, if there is a change in case. And there is another interesting uh, thing coming up, uh, which is DFI. Uh, uh, this, is, this is Education Beyond Classroom by, uh, a panel discussion by Dr. Akrangcha Tyagi and Dr. Ajanta Sachan. Uh, this is a women program in the foundation. Uh, I think it's of interest to everyone, of course, and uh, it's being brought in by the group, uh, women group in DFI, you can say. So this is another interesting program. I would like uh, to invite you and please inform your friends as well. And uh, I hope you understand that this is your program. Uh, this whole effort is a uh, student, uh, you can say, uh, initiative and it is for you. And I hope your contribution is more active and please come forward with your suggestions, with your comments. 
and your participation in these events. So thank you all for attending and hope to see you all and many more, more of your friends in the next sessions. Looking forward to it. So with that, uh, I'll be signing off. Uh, I'm Amit Prashant, IIT Gandhinagar. And uh, the real work has been done by, I think, uh, the DFI India team. And we should thank them uh, for bringing this up uh, for us. Uh, that includes uh, Pranab Mahindran and uh, many more people who are behind this work. And uh, also the leadership provided by Aniruddhan into this, uh, besides uh, the other advisory group and so on. So it's amazing job, DFI. Uh, big applause to all of you. So Pranab, uh, can we now wrap up? Sure, sir.